Fanatics CEO Michael Rubin and Fanatics Collectibles CEO Mike Mahan recently came to Cards HQ and spent a couple of hours touring through this store. And during their visit, I got to learn some things. It was awesome getting to spend a couple of hours with them talking about the future of the sports card hobby and some of Fanatics and Topps plans for that future and hearing from them what they liked about the store, but also how they think things are going for the hobby overall right now. In today's special episode, I'm going to be sharing with you clips from their visit, behind the scenes moments of conversations with me and the two Michaels learning about Fanatics and Topps future and I'm gonna share with you my thoughts on everything we learned. Hello, and here we go. Welcome to a special edition of the Jeff Wilson Show. And and since this is yes. such a special edition <laughs> episode, you bring in the the guns. I'm bringing in the guns. <laughs> I'm bringing back in my original co-host yeah. of the Jeff Wilson Show, Kelly. Hi. It's Hi, great. everybody. How's it, it going? It is great to see you on the show again. Yes. It has been a while. It has been a while. It's been a different change of set. Mm -hmm. Yeah, different location to where we're filming the studio. It's been a Big change, but I think uh, one of the cool things about having me on at this moment is, you know, Jeff Wilson show changed a little bit about, you know, bringing on different people within the hobby, having these larger interviews, which I think is so wonderful, but it is also a change because it's like, there's also a new thing now that we're talking about. And a lot of what we're going to be reviewing and like the clips and, and the comments that you had with Ruben and, and Mahan is about that change it's about cards hq it's about this big endeavor that you know you talked about a lot on the show with you know ryan and carter and just the actual process of making this but having somebody like ruben and mayhan come into the store and like see it and talk to you and figure out the the logistics and the specific questions they asked a lot of questions, which I know we're going to all get to, but like, it's just, I think it's a full circle moment at the moment. It's a great way of putting it. It yeah. is a full circle moment. It was certainly a really cool moment, like yeah. to, you know, to build the store and to have Michael Rubin, one of the, one of the, you know, all time great entrepreneurs mm -hmm. in the United States, one of the richest men in the world and his company fanatics. I mean, you know, 10 billion plus, you know, type of company. Yeah. And, and it's just incredible what he's done and the success that he's had. So to have him come and want to learn from us and mm -hmm. want to see the store and hear about things that we did. And then of course, Mike, uh, uh, Mike Mahan was mm -hmm. with him as well, who's the uh, CEO of Fanatics Collectibles. Mike Mahan, very acclaimed in his own right too, mm -hmm. a former CEO of Dick Clark Productions. He's done a lot of big things over the years. So to have both of them here, it was really cool. And it was a full circle moment, as you said, and we learned a lot from it. And, yeah. and I wanted to bring you on today to talk through those things that we learned that we're going to share with the audience because you were part of the whole visit. You were yeah. next to me the whole time as we were touring them through. So you heard a lot of the, uh, the conversation oh, that we're yeah. going to talk about today yeah. and we're part of a lot of the conversation. So let's jump right in. The way that this is going to work is I'm going to play some clips for the mm -hmm. audience and then we're going to, you know, they're going to get a sense hearing directly, uh, you know, moments from that visit behind the scenes moments that haven't been made public before. And then we're going to talk through each of these. And, and I, I want to start with this one because I think there's something really interesting for the audience to learn here. How long have you been open for now? How's baseball biz been? How much is kind of wax and new stuff versus, you know, kind of secondary parts? How much are you buying direct from us versus distributors in other places? And what do you attribute that to? What it costs you to open the store? What kind of marks do you make on singles versus, what's an average trade that I look from you from like how many people come in for an average trade? Like? And how's the margin of singles versus wax? How much of the build out were the cases? But how big is your breaking slide? business right now? So my takeaway from that, Kelly, yeah. <laughs> they asked, obviously, <laughs> a as lot you can of questions. see, a ton <laughs> of questions. And that was just actually a small sample yeah. of the number of questions. Oh, we yes. probably could have run that clip for three or four yeah. minutes of them just asking questions. You know, um, it's interesting to me as an entrepreneur to see what more accomplished entrepreneurs have done and how they've approached things. Mm -hmm. Michael Rubin, uh, he presents himself. You know, if you if you watch him on social media, that kind of stuff, he presents himself as kind of a cool CEO, right? Mm -hmm. Like he he dresses fashionably, he hangs out with lots of famous pop culture people. Mm -hmm. He he presents 
he presents like a, a cool guy, right? Yeah. And so I thought it was interesting that when I got around him in person and we got to spend quite a bit of time together, that he was drilling down yeah. on on very specific questions. Oh, yes. He wanted to know the numbers. It wasn't it wasn't cool guy Michael Rubin. It was business shark Michael Rubin. And boy, did he want to get specific when it mm -hmm. came to tell me this number, tell me that number. Do you know this number? What's that number? I mean, a lot of it. It's really interesting to see how you know in detail. And of course, it makes sense. I mean, yeah. if you're if you're if you're running a, a company that's billions and billions of dollars, you need to know your numbers. But it mm -hmm. shows you that his mindset, uh, that that you know specificity and that that precision to detail is probably a large part of what got him there. Yeah, I mean, it just walking around with you guys when the questions were being asked I mean, you can even see it in that clip they were just dialed in it just felt like it was in, in the in the best way in the best sense i mean there were people there there were a lot of people there that night um it was past our actual opening hours so it was also very interesting to see just how many people were there for like ruben and mayhem but also at the same point in time you guys are walking around with them and they're dialed in and it feels like this very close conversation between three business leaders and Oh, like you said, a lot of these questions were so dialed in. They were so on point and they were very shark like, but not in like an aggressive manner, but in like a let's get down to the minute details of how this works, how you got here and what you see it could be going forward. And I think that was the most kind of refreshing part of it because we one of the big episodes we had when I was originally on here is we talked about fanatics and their comment about wanting to 10x the hobby and when you're around them and they're asking these questions that are are very specific to growth that just reemphasizes that point of 10xing yeah so it, it was it, really it cool to see dialed in is a good way of putting it that, yeah that's a good way of putting it they were they were very dialed in and I, you know, I, I guess maybe I should have expected that, right? But when they when they showed up for the tour, I didn't know if it was going to be just kind of a relaxed, relaxed yeah. tour, yeah. like let's have fun, let's tour yeah. through. But it was there was clearly a very sharp business element mm -hmm. to their reason for coming here and the mm -hmm. discussions. And as we go through this episode, the audience is yeah. going to get a real sense yeah. of this. This is a good episode. It's, it's going to be a good episode. It's a juicy episode. There's a lot to learn. <laughs> they spent quite a bit of time while they were here talking mm -hmm. about innovation yeah. and what Fanatics and Tops is bringing to the market in terms of innovation. And, mm -hmm. and you're going to see that here in this next clip. No, the debut patch was an incredible innovation by Mike. The, the, the buyback program is incredible. I mean, those are two. And by the way, look, keeping it real, the different innovative, more, like getting all these athletes kind of more engaged mm -hmm. in, in the hobby, getting kind of cultural people engaged in the hobby, all that is making a difference, you know, kind of just brick by brick. It's the way you build a business. We feel like legitimately, I know I say this all the time, but it's not like a shish deal. Like we feel like we're just getting going. Mm -hmm. Like we don't feel like, I mean, I mean, Mike's, has even been here two. We've only owned tops two years yeah. and yeah, and Change. two months. Yeah. All right. So there's some interesting takeaways from this clip, yes. right? So first of all, they they mentioned some of the innovative things that they've done mm -hmm. from a product standpoint. The MVP buyback program, right. definitely, absolutely innovative. Something a lot of collectors love. The fact that they can pull, you know, the certain cards out of out of out of certain tops products and bring them back into the stores and get store credit. Not just something, by the way that a lot of collectors really yeah. like, but also something that hobby shop owners love mm -hmm. because that MVP buyback program has driven, it, it gives customers a reason to come back into hobby shops mm -hmm. and get credit for hobby shops. It's actually a super forward thinking innovation that Tops brought to the table underneath Fanatic's leadership to really reward hobby shops and show their commitment to hobby shops. That's yes. been a big one. They mentioned the MLB debut patches, mm -hmm. Um, you know, and they've done a lot of those different types of product promotions, obviously the Brady cards, which will come right. up a little bit later <laughs> yep. in the episode today and, and, you know, various things like that, the first moment cards and all that kind of stuff, but clearly innovation, part of their strategy. Yes. They then also commented on things like, um, athlete involvement and how mm -hmm. that's part of their strategy mm -hmm. as well. I think that that's interesting. Um, but then, but then there was a sense of we're just getting started. Yeah. You know, yeah. and, and this this message around like we're just getting started is a message that I've heard repeated quite a bit mm -hmm. from, you know, from Ruben and Mahan and, and other leaders at Tops and Fanatics here in the in these recent months. And if you think about it, as as Michael Rubin said in that clip, 
it's only been two years and two, and two months, months since they bought tops <laughs> which is crazy in the That's grand crazy. scheme of things it's not that long they no. don't even have the football or basketball license no. yet so we really are just getting started oh, they yeah. really are just getting started conversations like that give me a lot of optimism about the future what what did you take away from that uh what i took away was a sentence that he had and i'm gonna i'm gonna pull it out because i did take notes on this but it was Brick by brick, it's how you build a business. I mean, when you think about that in, in an entrepreneur sense, it is very entrepreneurish, but it's like, it is brick by brick. It's new incentive by new incentive. It's new uh, ideation. It's these new ideas that you keep building on. And what may seem small or you know new at this moment, it's a cascading effect. So again, <clears throat> two, two years, two months, when you do think about it, just the amount of just sheer innovation that's happened just within that short time span, it does make you feel like those are the, they've already started laying their bricks. There are more bricks coming down. And then you're you're gonna see, again, we go back to this 10Xing, we go back to this idea of it's just getting started and it just gives you a lot of goosebumps. It gives you that good feeling that, oh, there's so much more to look forward to. And that's what I took away from it. Again, it's just that brick by brick moment. And you can see that when they, t and you'll see that for all of the clips that we're about to play today, they are so in tune with that brick by brick mentality. It's about the hard work. It's about the things you do day by day to keep moving us forward. Yeah, 100%. And it, it is, it, I find it very exciting and encouraging. Like I, mm -hmm. I think this next five to 10 years in okay. the sports card hobby, it's going to be really cool to see how this plays out. Mm -hmm. Now, look, I've got a lot of confidence in fanatics and tops. I've said that from the very beginning. And part of the reason why is because of things like this, of mm -hmm. those innovations they brought to the table and the fact that they are just truly getting started. They don't even have football or basketball yet. What is this going to look like in five years? I think a lot of really exciting things are going to happen and uh, it's going to be, it is going to be an absolutely fun ride. It was, mm -hmm. it was cool getting to talk to them about it. It was also neat getting to see their reaction to different things inside the store. And I, I want to play this next clip, which is centered around something specific that they really liked. These are great. Did you, you got this from, I saw on your, yeah. everybody from Japan. We got these from Japan from, yeah. yeah. So when I was in Japan, so in Japan, they have these they vertical know. ones. I'm like, that is such the obvious way to display cars. It is such None the None of the car shops have I, in the US. Yeah, I don't understand why they don't. Yeah. Could you even go it, higher or not? Yeah, you could go higher. Yeah. The only reason why we for kids and basically. Um, it, so some of the, some of them in Japan are up to like eight feet, but the only reason why we didn't is I, I was worried it might make the store feel more boxed in. We could probably do higher in certain places, but I wanted the store not to feel too boxed in. We had to get them custom manufactured in China. So we got actually the cases manufactured in China, and then we had a, we had a company in the U.S. build, the, build these inserts <coughs> for the cases. Um, and then, you know, and we had it all assembled here in the U.S. It's a, such a better look. Yeah, I agree. I mean, it looks great. I agree. Yeah, it's just, you know. How much of the build-out were the cases? What are the to the three? They weren't too bad. They so each case bad. all in, including the insert and everything, each of these cases cost us about 900 bucks. And that's landed here in the US delivered to the store. 900, um, 900 bucks, 900 bucks to a thousand bucks. Probably a thousand with assembly. That's right. It really wasn't too bad. What Just do the cases cost them per case? To make? Yeah. And they're double-sided by the way too. So, so. double-sided case. $4,500. Thousand bucks a case. Thousand bucks a case. Wow. By the way, yeah. how many cases are in here? Uh, and we got we got forty five of these of these types of cases throughout the store. So forty five thousand dollars a case. Uh, actually, yeah, great. Yeah, that should be the we case. spent a little, and then some of the other taller ones and whatever. But it really that that piece of it wasn't By too the bad. way, that that's a that should be uh, you should start making these cases for every. I know other and, hobby re shop. and make that a business. Yeah, I've had several or hobby or shops least, now. Or at least a service. Yeah, a needed service. Yeah, it is a needed service, honestly. It really is a needed service. So when they tore through, yeah. they were very focused on a lot of the aesthetic elements of yes. the store. Yep. And they've said in the past that it's it's a priority for Fanatics and Tops to have local card shops which offer a great presentation mm -hmm. to the customer. You know, they they honestly like the the card shops of of yesteryear. The old dusty card shops with the wood paneling on the walls. Right. I know a lot of people listening have nostalgia over those card shops because yes. that was the card shops of their childhood. Right. 
But there are a lot of card shops in this country which still look that way, yep. that still look the same as they did back in the 1980s. And while there are some that like that because they like the nostalgia factor, the truth of the matter is that new people coming into the sports card hobby mm -hmm. that don't necessarily have that nostalgic connection Correct. from 40 years ago, new people coming into the sports card hobby, if they walk in a shop like that, to them, it's going to feel outdated. Right. It's going to feel stale. And if they walk into a shop with a modern design and a modern aesthetic and good presentation, mm -hmm. to them, it's going to feel cool and it's going to feel like a place they want to go and it's going to feel like a place where something's happening because people have the owner has invested and mm -hmm. and it's a modern look and feel and clearly you can you can see from this clip and some more clips that we're going to show clearly that's something that fanatics and tops and michael rubin and mike mahan are valuing and here specifically we of course we're talking about the card cases the vertical nature of the cases and how they really the aesthetics yeah. of how those displayed were really important to them yeah i mean like we're in such an interesting position currently right now in the studio which i know that people can't really see opposite of what we're looking at but we've got a huge view right now in the studio of the actual shop and it keeps harking back to me on that conversation that you had with mike and and ruben and and in that clip ruben asked how tall can they go you know why did you think about making them taller and these are things that we discussed a lot in the design and planning of this shop you wanted sight lines you wanted to not feel like it was loaded down on you and there are a lot of choices that are made in a design sense for the feeling of the customer when they walk in and you you bring back to this thing about nostalgia yes there's a lot of nostalgia in the cardboard shops that exist still to this day because they do bring back that feeling that people have when they were younger but let me pose this question because i feel like it will tie tie back into design if you are going to a grocery store, are you going to want to go into a grocery store that looks like it hasn't been updated since the 80s? No, you're going to feel like, what there. is the product quality that we're going to get <laughs> out of this? I mean, yeah. sure, it's like a fun one-off experience, but I mean, you're going to want something a little bit more innovative, a little bit more sleek. And these are just, these are the conversations that have started happening and you see a lot more car trips opening up nowadays that have these more modern designs and it is again into that 10xing of it all but i w one thing i also want to point about but that specific clip because i thought it was really interesting is that he started asking you specifically about the numbers mm -hmm. like that again goes into that shark mentality. Well, you could tell from where, yeah, a hundred percent, and where he was going with yeah. that was he wanted to know how if if if, if other other card shops, mm -hmm. how many dollars would they have to invest to get all of their cases to look like this? Yep, and that's what he wanted to know. And so he's starting to think in his mind. You could tell he's you know they're they're probably trying to put a blueprint together for what should be invested into having a really high quality card shop experience. Mm -hmm. And, you know, having cases like this, in his opinion, is part of having a really high quality card shop experience. So you could tell, you could see the wheels turning yeah. and you could see the fact that he was like, okay, so if you're going to spend this much on cases. And, and by the way, after that clip, he continued to drill down on how much everything else in the store costs yes. too. <laughs> yeah. So he was trying to get a sense of all the different yeah. elements of the cost of the store and, uh, and and how that would translate into the investment that would be required for new card shop owners in the future yeah. to build something that looks really great. Yeah, I mean, it's just tied back into the way that he's constantly, again, being dialed in to what exactly is in front of him and how to continue to re reinvest and, you know, again, move forward the hobby as, as he continues to to talk about in the next coming clips yeah i want to yeah. i want to show this next one in yeah. particular um because there are some points in this one that i think are really interesting how many more stores do you want to do do you have ambitions for more stores i would love to do more shops i mean you know i wanted to get this one open and get it kind yeah. of up and running you get this um, work in the way you want it to work you let me say something we want to support you opening the stores like this we, i appreciate yeah. it yeah, yeah. But i mean we like look at the end of the day we want to allocate products to the people that right you know have the best presentation well, and, and build community right yeah. embrace community that's, yeah Look and around. That's, I mean, that's what the whole entire thing it's is. It's eight thirty on a Monday night. Yeah, yeah and we got, and yeah, yeah, people, people have come here. I mean, it's, it's, it's awesome. is Monday is our slowest day of the week, and we're normally closed now. But I mean, it just showed that the community is strong. We are absolutely packed on the weekends. It's awesome. Okay, so clearly, mm -hmm. <laughs> Michael Rubin, Mike Mahan are expansion yes. 
minded. Yes. They like what they saw here. They're pro expansion. They, they're pro expansion. <laughs> they're pro growth, right? Yeah. They want there to be more shops like this. And I, I made the point to them during their visit and they wholeheartedly agreed that in order to grow the hobby, one of the, you know, if you want to 10 X the number of collectors, in my opinion, one of the very best ways of doing it is to have incredible local card shops yep. throughout the country. Mm -hmm. Every every major city in the country should have incredible local card shops mm -hmm. that provide an amazing experience. If you want to 10X the number of collectors in the hobby, that, in my opinion, is probably the number one way to do it. Mm -hmm. Give new collectors a touch point, new and established collectors. Give them a place to come into, to build community, to experience the hobby, to be to be able to transact cards at fair prices, have that point where they can all come together and experience it together. And clearly, clearly from that clip, you can see Michael Rubin and Mike Mahan are very focused on aesthetics and community yes, as two elements that a card shop needs to have in order for them to want to really continue to invest in it mm -hmm. and see it expand. Yes. Well, um, Yes. And I, I think it's I think it's so great when you when they're here and they're physically in the store and then the next question or one of the questions posed is, OK, when are you opening up the next one? Um, while, you know, that is that's a I know it's something that we have talked about. I know it's things that other people have talked about, but it is agreeing in this sense that. Look, the hobby is a lot about community, right? It's a, it's, it's a lot about the feeling that you get when you're around people or when you're around this product that you love. But the hobby is also a physical, tangible thing. It's something that you're holding a card in your hands. You're ripping a box. You're, you know, touching the 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 card, the cardboard. It's it's this sensory hobby and it's based a lot in emotion and attachment to the sport that you love to the player that you love to the product that you love so having these physical places that people can go to that elevate the hobby but also bring in the community as much as we really try to focus on here you know with the breaker arena with the live streaming cabanas with the trade nights that we have with the tcg gameplay that we're going to start it is a lot about embracing that community and and pulling back in that physical tangible uh emotional feeling that you get and i think that that is you know that's something that they care deeply about. They care deeply about it, and they've made it very clear, as you can see in that clip, that they want to reward mm -hmm. the card shops and support the card shops. Well, that it's, in, it's caring in, about in their the movement opinion forward. Are doing it right. Yeah, in their opinion, yeah. are are investing in in all of those things and doing it the right way, and they should use that leverage. I mean, Tops and Fanatics, they have the leverage. They have the products mm -hmm. that every card shop wants to get to sell. So they can use that leverage that they have to reward the card shops that are doing things the right way, that are building community, that are giving collectors that amazing touch point when they walk in the show, in the store, that are investing and putting effort into the presentation. And they're going to do it. They're, they're going to invest in those shops. They're going to support the growth of those shops. And shops that don't update themselves over time I think they may be feeling less support and seeing less support from tops and fanatics and and that's going to be the way that it's going to be. Yeah. And there's, you know, there's there's other elements to it as well. In fact, I want to I want to roll this next clip just to paint a little bit of a wider picture. Yeah. So as long as you're selling to collectors, you know, like for a direct business, we're going to want to do everything humanly possible to support you because we want great looking experience mm -hmm. that helps kind of elevate everything that's happening and you know, that's that's who we want to support for us, so I mean, it's, you know, we want people invest in their stories. Yeah. We want people getting new people into the hobby. Yeah. One thing I found really interesting about that last clip was actually how the clip started. The mm -hmm. first thing that Michael Rubin said in that clip was, so long as you sell to collectors. Correct. Then we're going to support you if you're doing things, you know, the right way, investing in the aesthetics of the shop and everything like that. But mm -hmm. so long as you sell to collectors. Now, that's an interesting caveat because... When Fanatics got involved in the game, one of the things that they said they they were going to do and they have done and are continuing to do was cut out the distribution network and deal directly yep. with the end consumer, but also deal directly with card shops and mm -hmm. not have to go through distributors to sell to card shops. And in fact, Tops has expanded 
dramatically the number of card shops that have direct accounts that are buying from them. I think they've more than doubled yeah. the number of card shops with direct accounts since the time that they, you know, were were bought by Fanatics a little over two years ago. Um, and they've the reason why they've done that is then they've cut out a lot of the distributors, a lot of the middlemen. The situation that had that was previously happening in the hobby that Tops is now trying to clean up is that some card shops became their own middlemen. Right. Some, and we've talked about this before. Some yeah. card shops almost became their own mini distributor. Some card shops, because of relationships they built years and Correct. years and years <laughs> ago, ended up with oversized allocations, mm -hmm. allocations of more product than they could actually sell within their retail footprint. Those card shops then, in many cases, started acting like mini distributors on their own. There were many card shops in this country that would get a whole bunch of Topps prod products and then immediately would never hit the shelves of the store. They would immediately sell some of it to breakers directly. They would sell some of it to other card shops who didn't have direct accounts directly. They would put some of it on eBay. Mm -hmm. They would put some of it on DealerNet. They would they would do whatever they they could do to move all that product. But every time they moved it, they were making profit and profit. So they wanted as much allocation as they could get, right. well beyond what they could sell in their store because they wanted to be able to move it. Well, and make profit on all of it, right? Well, Tops and Fags didn't like that, right? They want they want card shops, they want card shops to get as much allocation as they can sell in their store to or, collectors to to collectors yeah right or through their own means like through their own website or through their through their own like breaking but once again to collectors mm -hmm. they don't want the shops to serve as the middleman so what the, what they're saying in this clip is yes we're going to invest in the shops that are that are are not just doing things the right way from an aesthetic standpoint and from a community building standpoint but that are also serving collectors Correct. and are not trying to serve other themselves. dealers or, yeah. or really ultimately themselves 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely yeah. no that 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 just goes back to the core strategy that i think that tops and fanatics has in in wanting to elevate the experience and elevate the hobby um you are wanting to cut out the back the you know backdoor handshakes and the the you know this this guy has this guy and this product is for this and it's 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 more clear and defined and i think that people in general especially people who are n newly coming into the hobby the easier that they can understand how something works the more trust that they have with that process and so we're even talking about you know new card shops that want to open up the easier and the more straightforward the process is for a new card shop that's going to be selling to new collectors and understanding how allocation works the more that they're going to trust the process it's you know this hobby is old there's been a lot of years of it working certain ways and benefiting certain people but not necessarily towards the end where the main consumer that matters most which is the collector there's a lot of money being taken out of the chain yes a lot of money being taken out of the chain yeah which then which then jacks up the price right. for the end collector because now the end collector is paying the markup mm -hmm. from the distributor and from the dealer and then from the person the dealer sold it to and that's like you know markup 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 mm -hmm. and and who ultimately pays for that the collector the collector, the the collector, collector. does so again i think you know, you talked about Tops and Fanatics having this weight and this ability to change things based off the fact of who they are as a company and then the weight that they bring and the history of business that they bring alongside them. And I think that this is one of those good things where they do have to put this sort of business foot down to say, no, we're not doing this anymore. This is this is hindering and also, you know, having a damage to our end target customer which is the consumer it is yeah. the collector yeah yeah no I, i'm glad that they're aware of that there's other elements of the of the collector experience that they're honed in on as well mm -hmm. I, I think this next clip's going to get to some of that and how was rip night rip night was great yeah we had yeah i appreciate you sending meek meek yeah. was great meek was, was a lot of fun meek was really meek, meek was a really super cool dude yeah he's got great energy yeah he had great energy the crowd loved him he gave away but you also a have bunch lots of cards. Of people. Like this is a good market for like culturally relevant. Yes, a hundred percent. Atlanta, you know, you get the, you get diversity here, which you don't see in the card market in a lot of parts of the country. And we get good diversity here. Like we get all kinds of different backgrounds and ethnicities walking into this shop in Atlanta, and that's that's cool. Like which that's, I love. it's good to see. Yeah, it's really important to see. 
Um, and it was great having Meek here. He was awesome. Chipper was Chipper was great too. So we had them over at that Breaker Arena. You definitely, and they, you definitely get a mix of. Uh, you definitely got some some uh, different different uh, backgrounds and cultures yeah. there. It's perfect. Yeah. So diversity, obviously a priority for fanatics. Obviously a priority for Michael Rubin. You know, here in Atlanta, we have the highest African American population of any major metro in the United States. And we have a lot of other ethnicities, a lot of other, you know, cultures and nationalities. Big international city. Yeah. Big international city, yeah. well represented here in Atlanta, a lot of different types of cultures. And a lot of them have come into Cards HQ. Oh, yeah. it's, it's, it's great to see the diversity, the different nationalities, the different cultures that have come into the shop. It, it feels... When you're here inside Cards HQ, it feels more diverse mm -hmm. than maybe what you have traditionally seen from the sports card market or yes. from the sports card <laughs> hobby, right? Yeah. From the typical hobbyist, yeah. from the typical collector. But that has been changing nationally, yeah. not just in Atlanta, which I think is leading the way in many ways, mm -hmm. but it has been changing nationally. If you went to the National this past year, you saw more diversity at the National than you would have five years ago. And right. I went to the National five years ago, right. and I could tell you that the National, you know, this past year was definitely more diverse. Now, it still isn't nearly as diverse as normal society. Correct. You still have yeah. an overabundance of, you know, white middle-aged men specifically yeah. who are collectors. Mm -hmm. um, you don't, you know, you still don't have obviously enough women and you still don't have you know, enough other, you know, races necessarily, you know, ethnicities, nationalities necessarily uh, in it. Mm -hmm. Yet all of those other segments are growing. Yeah. We're seeing more diversity. We're seeing more people come in. And it's clearly something that Ruben wants to see. And it makes sense because he's trying to create this connection to pop culture. Oh, yeah. He's trying to create this connection to athletes. Obviously, sports is extremely diverse, you know pop culture music he had meek mill here mm -hmm. which he commented on there for tops rip night obviously extremely you know ton of diversity in pop culture mm -hmm. and so bringing more of that diversity into the hobby is going to help is going to frankly just help the entire thing grow yeah yeah, yeah. No, there, there so i'm going to go back to my notes but there was one thing that he said that i just i want to pull into because he said that the Atlanta market again because we're talking about Atlanta we're only physically in one market at this moment but the Atlanta market is a good market for culturally relevant interesting people I, again this pulls into like Meek Mill right so it is that that play into pop culture but it is this play also into this fact of like in in a community sense when you have people who are more diverse coming together them within themselves are going to pull in Again, their pocket of friends, which could be more diverse, their pocket of friends, which could be more diverse, which I do feel like ends up becoming this snowball effect, which in turn, like you like you said, national five years ago, maybe not the most diverse thing societally we see, but each year it's a snowball effect. And the more and more diverse that we become each year, the more diverse the hobby becomes as a whole, which is what fanatics and tops are pushing for yeah yeah and and i think it's going to continue to go in yeah. that direction clearly a priority for for ruben as you saw in that clip there's another group mm -hmm. that they want to get more involvement in the hobby from more represent more representation as well you're going to see that in this next clip you know what's great about this is that when people pull cards from the hobby shop it's rarely on camera right so now you, yep. you combat that, which is awesome. And they can go clip it for social media exactly. too. So yep. that's the other thing. We wanted to create an experience where, and honestly, it's mainly used by kids, but like all day long Saturdays, all day long Sundays, we have kids here all day opening boxes, telling their friends to go on YouTube and watch it. If we it. lived in Atlanta, I know where my kids would be. Yeah, exactly. And then they clip working, it and put it on like- Working and right, breaking. Put on Instagram and the whole thing. So yeah, and then of course, because we got the car cam set up, so people can sit back here, their friends can sit back here, watch what they're doing. We've had a bunch of people ask us about birthday parties. Like, can we yeah, do sure. kids, you know, awesome. birthday parties for 12 year old kids? We're, we're gonna put together like a package. Awesome. We're gonna do like one in a couple of weeks as like a trial run. But yeah, I think the idea of doing birthday parties Love is, a, great is a cool thing. Great, great idea. Well, that's yeah. by the way, talk about bringing people into the hobby. Yeah, exactly, literally. exactly. So that clip started with them commenting on our breaker arena. Yeah. But then, you know, there was a little bit of interesting at the end of that clip yeah. when we started talking about <laughs> kids and birthday parties and Ruben thinking that it was a great idea to try to do those types of things. Mayhan talking about yep. his own kids yep. and how much they would love the experience of, you know, breaking at the breaking arena and that type of thing. Kids are a big 
focus for fanatics and tops. Yeah. They started a program they announced at last year's Tops Industry Conference that they were starting a program with Little League Baseball where uh, as kids were registering for Little League Baseball, last year it was in like, I think like 10 select states and soon it's going to be, I believe, national um, where they're going to get, you know, like packs of cards and different things. We're seeing... A, in this store here inside Cards HQ, mm -hmm. we get a ton of kids. Yeah. We're seeing kids come in. If you come here on Saturdays, kids are coming in after their baseball games. We just had a, a group of kids in for their spring break. Yeah. 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 We had, we've had tons of kids from their spring break yeah. travel into Atlanta, come here, spend time in the shop. And it's uh, getting more kids involved mm -hmm. is key. And I think Tops and Fanatics are really, really focused on that. Panini Panini has done things as well, right? Yep. Um, you know, they did their, their kids' crates. Uh, and that kind of thing. But I think in particular, Tops and Fanatics seem to be going an extra mile, seem yeah. to be really wanting to bring kids in. And so it was just kind of interesting hearing them comment on things from that angle during their visit. Yeah, well, it, the kids are the future, right? Mm -hmm. You know, they're, the earlier that you can get a kid into the hobby and and experience and understand the joy and the love of collecting and you know ripping boxes and you know collecting your favorite players and then watching you know the the game on the tv while you rip a pack of cards i mean it's it, it is that idea of of a tangible cascading again snowballing effect if, if a kid starts young they're going to have the joy and that love that's centered all throughout their life it's a it's a foundational building experience for them it is also good business wise I know that there was a, a moment that I we don't get this clip but there was a moment where you know Ruben had a good conversation with your son Reeves on yeah. just entrepreneurship yeah. and and the and the trading aspect of and how it taught him so many business lessons and I think that that's extremely important it's it's about it's about giving the kids the joy of the hobby, but also giving the kids the understanding of the yeah, hobby. Yeah, 100%. The lessons yeah. learned through cards. I mean, I credit yeah. a lot of my entrepreneurial success to the fact that I was, you know, buying and selling and trading cards back when I was a kid. I see it now with my own sons. Ruben had that experience when he was a kid. Mm -hmm. A lot of people listening to this, you know, probably had that experience. They were into it as kids and they learned lessons, you know, sometimes tough lessons, yeah. right? Making, yeah. making bad trade deals yeah. or paying too much money for a particular card from a dealer or selling a card for too low or whatever. It, it's not always positive experiences, but that's part of it. And that's how you learn and how you cut your teeth on it. So I, I think it's a wonder, wonderful thing for kids to get involved in. I'm happy that they are focus there. Yeah. All right. I wanted to show uh, what I thought was kind of a fun clip here, a fun little conversation that we had. We just said we were amazed at the Brady card that says if baseball doesn't work out, there's always yeah. football. Do you think it's in one of these? I, 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 I think it is in one of these back boxes. We, I think it is. We, have it. we were We've, just saying yeah. over the weekend, like we can't believe some of that card. It hasn't been pulled yet. yet. So I thought that that was a fun moment. Yeah. Obviously, Michael Rubin, very aware yeah. that the grail card, hasn't been you pulled. know, hasn't been pulled yet. Right. So we're talking about the, you know, the Tom Brady Montreal Expos baseball cards that were in Bowman draft 2023 mm -hmm. uh, Bowman Chrome draft. And the the card the gold out of 50 specifically card number 12 of 50 right. was the one where Brady did the very special inscription on the card i think it said you know if 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 baseball if, doesn't work in, work out there's always football there you go yeah. right and yeah. and and so that's the one that's got a crazy bounty is it like a half million dollar bounty yeah. i think that that was put on that card it hasn't been pulled yet no. and a ton of that product has been opened obviously ruben is eagerly anticipating that card being pulled we do have a lot of boxes of that product here in the store. I just think we need to have a rip night. I think I we mean. need to have a rip night and try to find it. I thought that was fun that, that you know, Ruben commented on like- uh, Could um, it be in HQ? Could it be in Cards HQ? Man, I would love for that to be in Cards HQ. I would love for it to be. That would be yeah, incredible. Yeah, we have opened up a lot of boxes. We've not found it yet. No. We found some other really good cards. Oh yeah. But I mean, the, I've, the breakers have just been, you know, pulling in incredibly sick cards and it's such a good thing to see but I mean like the, the good thing about that is like with the breaking business it's all it's you know it's it's not necessarily a benefit to us it's a benefit to other people who don't have the ability to get that product readily at hand and so then they buy into the break and then you know they get they get that pull and so there's just been so many great cards pulled there's been so many customers who are just out of out of this world happy with the cards that that we've been pulling here yeah well ho hopefully someone in this store finds that Brady yeah, that sometime, sometime soon. Maybe hopefully they they maybe break it the break arena. Or, you there know. you go. There you go. Young kid.
All right, I want I want to wrap with one final clip. Okay. I thought this was kind of a good summary clip for their visit. Let's let's roll this one. You guys make us proud. Like what yeah, you guys have done. Appreciate it. Amazing. This is awesome. And yeah. it's like this is honestly like this is what we this is what we want. This right. is what we expect. This is like it gets us excited. Like, right. It gets us to, you know, we can't. We don't, you know, we want incredible hobby shops. We want vibrant entrepreneurs. So this is what it's all about. So that clip came towards the end of their time here. And mm -hmm. what an amazing yeah. way to wrap it up. I mean, it was, it was awesome having them here. I was so excited how into the store they were and how much they liked it, how much they appreciated what we did. But it also, it, you know, what they said there, right? They want to support incredible hobby shops. They want to support vibrant entrepreneurs yep. that excites me because it's not just what we're doing here in cards hq what that means is that they are going to be looking all over the country yes. all over the world for entrepreneurs and hobby shops that are going to invest that are going to build businesses in this space that are going to do big things and grow the ecosystem correct and they're squarely focused on wanting to support those types of people and support those types of endeavors it's the right mindset. It's cool to see them say it. And of course, I'm very thankful for their support here at Cards HQ. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't really feel like there's much I can add to that because you, you've hit all points. I mean, it, the the basis of these you know clips are coming from a, a, a tour that you gave them in the shop. You know, it's something that we've been working for forever. We didn't even know they were going to come. They expressed their want to come see the shop. But it, it is one of those things where it's like you're you're saying this. It's you know we took a we we you took a big risk on this store. Um, you know we always intended it to be amazing, and I think the we're just at the peak of where the store is. And I think that with this type of shop and with other shops are around the country, I think you know they're they're gonna push it forward. They're gonna help push it forward. And again, that's just about ten xing. Yeah, I'm super excited about it. And, and you know, like like Ruben said in one of those earlier clips, like we're just getting started here, yeah. right? I mean, there's so much, so brick much by more brick. we want to do. Brick by brick. There's so much yeah. more we want to do at Cards HQ. There's so much more we want to do for the sports card hobby as a whole. It's awesome having, you know, people notice that and people want to support that and people appreciate that. Um, and it was awesome having them here. It was a yeah. great visit. Uh, I know we learned a lot from it. We had a great, we had great takeaways with it. And hopefully the audience learn from listening to some of these clips as well. I mean, I think there's a lot of things to be read in there, especially yeah. for anybody who's looking to start a hobby shop or maybe runs a hobby shop or is thinking about starting a business in the space. Yeah. There's a lot to be gleaned from some of the things that were that were said there in terms of getting that support from yeah, off the chain. Yeah, just the dialed in of the questions that were yeah. being asked. They 100%. were very direct. Very direct. They're very focused on growing yeah. it. It's exciting to see. And Kelly, it was exciting having yeah. you join me for the show again Thanks. today. <laughs> it was great to see you again. It, fe it feels like, you know, putting on a, a old old jacket that you remember wearing a lot. And you're like, oh, yeah, this is really comfortable. Well, we'll have to have you on <laughs> again soon. And, of course, it was great having all of you out there in the audience join the show today as well. And I just want to remind you that the full-length episodes of The Jeff Wilson Show are available not just on YouTube under The Jeff Wilson Show channel on YouTube, but they're also available on Apple Podcasts and on Spotify. So make sure you are subscribed everywhere so you can listen to The Jeff Wilson Show on the go. Thank you for watching, and we'll see you soon with our next episode. Take care.